It's good to be with you this morning as we gather for worship here on the Lord's Day in this Eastertide season. I want to welcome you this morning, and it is good to be with you in the presence of the Lord in the Lord's house. I'd like to invite you to also take a moment to stand, to greet your brothers and sisters in Christ. Tell them you're glad to see them on this sunny Sunday morning. Oh, okay. What is If you would please make your way back to your pews as you do, I'd like to invite Amy Lucas to come now and bring us our morning announcements. Good morning. Welcome to Beverly Heights Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. And a special welcome if you're visiting with us. We're so happy that you've made your way here this morning to be with us in this place. I'd like to bring a few announcements to your attention. They can be found in this week's Gathered Seeds. If you haven't picked up a copy, I invite you to do so, so that you have this week's prayer requests and announcements. And you can find that at the back entrances or in the hallway here behind me. First of all, I want to remind our incoming sixth graders that on Wednesday at 4 o'clock, there'll be a child care class offered by Lisa Tiger for any of the children who want to have help with assisting in child care moving forward. If you have not yet let Lisa know that you plan to attend, please do so um, as soon as possible so she can be prepared for that group on Wednesday. We are excited to celebrate our 2022 graduates on Sunday, June 5th. And so parents, we're asking that you provide us with the following information about your graduating senior to the church. The name of the high school or the college they graduated from and any awards or scholarships and their future plans. And we ask for some photos, a current photo and also a, a baby photo as well. Uh, information, all of that information is listed out for you in Gathered Seeds. Um, but we ask for that information as soon as possible so that we can compile it for our celebration on Sunday. June 5th. Unfortunately, my husband is out of town this weekend and he is not able to give the axe throwing announcement and so there will be far less humor than normal um, and in this men's ministry announcement he would of course have some um, antics to uh, provide for you as well but I will not have that this morning. I do want to let you know that Tuesday, May 31st, axe throwing for men has been scheduled from 7 to 9. You can sign up going to beverlyheights.org slash forms. All um, participants must be at least 13 years old and the cost is $35 per person. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to see me or also my husband, Andy, and we'll be able to help you with any questions you might have about that. And then if you're on our email distribution list, you probably received an email from Pastor Nate a few weeks ago that was detailing our summer schedule moving forward. We're excited um, to uh, gather together as one worshiping congregation starting on Memorial Day Sunday. We'll be shifting our time a little bit earlier. We'll be gathering for Christian Ed at 9, and our worship service will be at 10, and then we'll, we'll have a time of fellowship following that. Um, we, if you are on our mailing list, you would have received a postcard this week in the mail with a schedule to put on your refrigerator so that you can keep track of, of that schedule as we move throughout the summer. And then also, and that was an information about one of the Sunday school classes being offered this summer. There will, there will be two adult Christian ed classes offered um, throughout the month of June and July, but one of them is called Beverly Heights Church 101, and we invite you to um, take part in that class if you would like to have a refresher on the basics, if you want a confirmation class for adults. We also invite you to take that class if you are interested in um, entering into membership here at Beverly Heights Church. And if you are interested in entering into membership, we ask that you let me know um, so that I can keep track of that for record keeping and we have all the files we need on hand for that. Um, so if you are interested in joining Beverly Heights Church officially as a member, please let us know and uh, look forward to that class in, in June and July. Thank you. If you would please now take your bulletins and join with me in our invitation to worship. As we come into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in this Eastertide season, I share with you, Christ is risen.
Heavenly Father, we do come into your presence this morning with a jubilant song in our mouths and in our hearts as we recognize the season that we find ourselves in, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed again and again through the Easter tide season. Lord, may our hearts and our lives be filled with the joy of the resurrection. May we hear again and again the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ has overcome sin and death for us and that through him and in him and to him are all things and that through the Lord Jesus Christ we have life and life everlasting. Help us, Lord, to know and to embrace and to walk in the abundant life that you've given to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to worship you today in spirit and in truth. Help us, Lord, to worship you with the joy that we have because Christ is risen. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 302. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing, Come Christians, Join to Sing. of reading taken from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May there be abundance of grain in the land, on the tops of the mountains may it wave, may its fruit be like Lebanon, and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. Him this morning is number 266. Come, ye faithful, raise the strain.
we continue in this Eastertide season and we are reminded again and again of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are also reminded again and again that the resurrection was preceded by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was preceded by our sin. You and I have been in rebellion against the Lord ever since our forefather in the flesh, Adam, and mother in the flesh, Eve, raised their hand against the Lord by taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We have been raised in their likeness. Their weakness is our weakness. And we find ourselves committing sin, sin that must be atoned for, sin that must be forgiven, sin that Christ died in order to put it away as far as the east is from the west. And so I want to encourage you in this Eastertide season, in in the light of, the full light of the resurrection, to come before the Lord, to search your heart as I will, to confess our sin, to seek God's forgiveness and grace, and to be reminded because that Christ is risen, our sins are forgiven. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we want to be that people who come faithfully, raising the strain of triumph and gladness, declaring that you, O Lord, have brought your people into joy, out from sadness, that you have redeemed a people for yourself, you've blessed them, you've freed them from bondage, corruption, decay. Lord, we are those people. We are the ones for whom you died, and you died for our sin. And so we gather ourselves together this morning and we confess our sin throughout the week, throughout our lives. We have failed to live in accord and in obedience with your perfect will and your good pleasure. We fail because we're weak. We, we fail because we don't give adequate attention. We fail because we're ignorant. We fail for a multiplicity of reasons, Lord. But you never fail. And your victory, which was achieved on the cross and was then affirmed boldly and triumphantly through the empty tomb, that victory is sufficient and strength and power to overcome our weakness and to overcome sin and death itself. And so, Lord, I pray that you would come to us today in resurrection power, meeting us in our moment of need, meeting us, Lord, as we confess our sin, supplying to us the grace and the mercy and the kindness, supplying to us words of affirmation and grace that declare to us As we hear the words of the Lord Jesus, because I died for you, because my blood is sufficient, your sins are forgiven. We hear these words, Lord, and we are humbled. We hear them and we rejoice. We hear them and we offer to you our thanksgiving and praise that you would come, that you would come to set us free and to forgive us of our sins. Thanks be to God, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us continue to worship as we continue to sing, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain. We'll stand.
This morning's Old Testament reading comes to us from Leviticus chapter 26, verses 1 through 13. You shall not make idols for yourselves, or erect an image or pillar, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your rains in your season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing, and you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land securely. I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword, sword shall not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will turn to you and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old store long kept, and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And I've broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to wait upon you as we continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
Oops, is this thing on, Nathan? I'd like to direct your attention now to our scripture lesson for this morning, which is taken from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 11. If you have your Bibles, please feel free to turn with me to that portion of scripture. If you don't have your Bibles uh, or your Bible, please feel free to take a pew Bible to follow along. As we are continuing in this sermon series, I am eager to uh, open up God's Word to you this morning and to share with you more about the abundant life. As you can probably tell from uh, my voice, I've been struggling with a cold for the last four days or so. It's not COVID, I promise, but uh, it has been um, a bit of a drag, if you will, and uh, it is uh, a bit of a distraction to me and hopefully not too much to you. Uh, but I am eager to uh, continue in this series on the abundant life, which began two weeks ago as we considered the Gospel of John, chapter 10, where Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly or life in the full. And I suggested to you then that Jesus was outlining the contours of that abundant life, uh, which began with uh, life uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, eternal life, as uh, Rick uh, opened up God's Word to us last week and this morning that goes on with the fruitful life as we consider the abundant life and the fruit that God has called us to produce with abundance. I suggested to you that those themes which are identified in John chapter 10 are uh, later enumerated and uh, further explained throughout John's gospel. And so as we consider the fruitful life, that was referred to as Jesus said, I am the door that leads to the pasture. The pasture is the place where you can feed with abundance and you, where the sheep can uh, produce more sheep in keeping after their kind. It is a place of abundance. That theme of abundance and fruitfulness is further explained in John chapter 15 as Jesus describes himself as the vine. And so I want to invite you to turn your attention there now and to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your teaching, the abundant life, what it means to bear fruit in keeping with righteousness. Help us, Lord, to receive your word today, to understand it, to inwardly digest it and find it integrated into our lives in order that your word might abide in us and bear much fruit in us. For you died and you rose in order that we might walk in abundant fruitfulness. And so we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in this place even now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> in my elementary years, I grew up in the small borough of Valencia. I know that good uh, pronunciation of that place in uh, Spain is Valencia, but here in western Pennsylvania we called it Valencia. I grew up in the small borough of Valencia just outside of 
Mars Township, which is northeast of Cranberry Township. Back then, in the late 70s and early 80s, Cranberry was nothing but farmland and woods, and we lived pretty much in it. I grew up in a small two-bedroom farmhouse, family of five, living in a two-bedroom farmhouse with a wraparound porch and a huge backyard. That was me there, sitting on the steps of the porch of that farmhouse, arms crossed disapprovingly, as I typically am. My twin brother to my left, Andrew, hard to imagine that we're twins, born on the same day. We are, though uh, our statue, stature is quite different. And then my baby sister, Rachel, there below us. There's a lot of lessons that I learned at that house. I learned how to open up our window and sneak out onto the roof, my brother and I, outside of our bedroom. And how we would take our G.I. Joe toys and throw them off the roof. I remember mostly all the hard work that we used to do around the house. I remember how we uh, one time had to dig a ditch because we had a well at the house and the township was bringing in the water, uh, municipal water, and uh, we were grateful for it, but we had to dig a ditch that went from the house to the street. And everybody else in the neighborhood hired a backhoe in order to dig out that ditch. And so I said to my dad, when are we getting the backhoe? And he said, why would I get a backhoe? I have two sons and a shovel. And so I remember for several days being outside digging that four foot deep by two foot wide trench that went from the house all the way to the road. I remember the hard work and the endurance. I remember the large garden that we had in the backyard. And I remember all of the labor that was required to maintain that garden. I remember when we had to till it and we rented a, uh, a, an autom- a uh, motorized tiller to till out the back uh, yard and that portion of it that was going to be our garden. I remember having to pull all the weeds in the summer heat and thinking to myself, is there no end to all these weeds? Seems like we're growing more weeds than we're growing vegetables. I also remember quite fondly the tremendous yield of food that we received from that garden at the end of the season and all the canning that we had to do and that large canning pot that was on the stove of that small kitchen and how every time we opened the lid the whole kitchen was filled with steam and there were the vegetables, the green beans and the tomatoes and the zucchini and the bell peppers, a tremendous abundance of garden vegetables. It was a very fruitful, abundant garden when we properly maintained it. There came a time when my interest in being free labor was on the wane. My parents' interest in maintaining the garden was starting to wane as well. And I remember there was a year in which we certainly grew more weeds than we grew vegetables because we were not properly maintaining the garden. A garden can be fruitful with abundance when properly maintained. And I share that with you because Jesus is telling us something similar in our text for this morning. He's telling us that the abundant life is a fruitful life when properly maintained. A fruitful life that Christ died in order that we might walk in. The abundant life is a life of consequence. Born from death and resurrection, and given to us in order that we might walk in it. And that is essentially what Jesus is saying to us in our text for this morning. If I were to distill John 15, 1 through 11, I would suggest to you the message is this a fruitful life is one that is filled with the consequences of Christ's death and the benefits of his resurrection. And it is a life that must be maintained. A fruitful life must be properly maintained to yield abundant resurrection outcomes and consequences in our lives. It doesn't just pop out of the earth. Certain conditions must be met in order for the fruitfulness to bear. These conditions are needed for fruitfulness in the natural order. 
If you've spent any time doing any gardening at your house, you know that there's certain effort, certain conditions that are needed for fruitfulness, and it's no less true for the spiritual. Those of you who garden will know the numerous environmental conditions and the numerous raw materials needed to produce a yield, a harvest of abundance, water, seed, appropriate temperature and sun. You need the right kind of soil conditions. You might need shade, depending on the variety of the plant that you're seeking to grow. You're dealing with environmental pressures. Any of you like me are trying to grow anything here in Mount Lebanon, it's like putting out a buffet for all the deer. So they come in every morning and make their way and say thank you for the, the breakfast that you've supplied for them. Environmental pressures that must be dealt with. Pesticides. As I'm watching all the aphids eat the leaves off of my rose bush right now. I need to apply some sort of pesticide to it to get the aphids to go so that the, 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 the rose bush will produce its flower. Time, energy, effort, all of these things, numerous things that are needed. Environmental conditions, raw materials in order to produce abundance, fruitfulness. But the Bible simplifies things for us. God simplifies the growth process and the elements that are needed for fruitfulness. He reduces it down to three essential things. Seed, tillage, and water. Seed, tillage, and water. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, Pastor Nate, that's pretty interesting, but where in the world do you get that? Where's that formula found? Well, if you will, take your Bibles and turn with me. Go all the way back to the beginning. The beginning of creation. The beginning of abundance. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 2. I want to direct your attention to the formula. that God speaks about creating fruitfulness. He says this in our text. Beginning with chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. God is bringing his creation to fulfillment and fruition. And all the things that he needs for fruitfulness are present. But there was no bush of the field. Was there, uh, when no bush of the field was yet in the land. And no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. God had put everything in place in creation in order for fruitfulness. But there was no annual. There was no growth. There was no fruitfulness. Why? For the Lord God had not yet caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. Seed, tillage, and water. God creates the earth with seeds in the ground. He produces his creation, and he's already established things in such a way so that the creation is positioned for fruitfulness because he has already deposited the seeds in the ground. When God made the earth, he made it with seeds in the ground. Genesis 2, 4 and 5 reveals that until rain and tillage, these yet unsprouted plants remained in the ground as seed, but the seed was already there. God's creative process was already complete in the span of six days, and it was all very good. God didn't have to go back out to the seed, uh, to, to Agway to get seed after he was done creating. No, he created the creation with seed in the ground. But these seeds were yet unexpressed, and they did not sprout because there was no rain and there was no tillage. But God filled the earth with seed. God pre-populates his earth with abundant seed. God is working in advance. In order to create the conditions for fruitfulness. He's doing that naturally. That's what Genesis 2, 4, and 5 is telling us. We've also seen that principle confirmed within the sciences. Did you know that every little baby girl who was born, both of my daughters, on the day that they were born, they were born with every egg in them that they would ever have in their lifetime. They're mammals. They had eggs. 
And every baby girl is already born with all the eggs that they're ever going to have, around 2 million at the time of their birth. God is already at work pre-populating with seeds to create the conditions for fruitfulness. He does so in the natural order, and he does so also in the spiritual. God is already at work in your life. He is working to populate you, to put into you particular kinds of seed that will produce fruitfulness and a harvest of righteousness. God works in this way. He's already at work predestining you to a life of fruitfulness, graciously at work in advance in order that you might produce spiritual fruit. And Jesus identifies for us in our text a number of the seeds that he has put into our life so that the proper conditions might be met in order that they might flower and blossom into fruit. Six seeds. If you still have your Bibles, go ahead and turn back to John chapter 15. I want to work you through the text to see the six seeds that Christ identifies that he is putting into our lives in order that we might walk in abundance and live a life of fruitfulness. The first seed is identified in chapter 15, verse 3. Already, Jesus says, already I am at work. Already I am depositing seeds into your life. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus speaks words. Words of life. Words that are seeds. He speaks storied words into our lives. And he tells us who we are. He explains life for us. He he explains our history to us. You were made in my image. You were created by God out of love with purpose and destiny. But you and everyone like you rebelled. Your kind rebelled against the Creator. You were driven into sin and you were driven out of that garden of fruitfulness and abundance. You were driven into exile. That's our history. The words, the seeds of history turn to the seeds of the gospel. As Jesus implants gospel seeds into your life, and he says, you were driven into exile, but you were in the desert, and I found you there. I came to you. I I entered into that desert with you, and my life became an atoning sacrifice for you in order that you might live. Jesus gives gospel words and he implants them into our lives. He confronts us with the bad news and then he gives us the good news and he puts it into us as a seed. Not only does Christ give us his word as a seed, he gives us a form of godliness. He gives us a target. He tells us where we're going, what the purpose and the point of life is. In verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus gives us the seeds of our formation. Jesus is giving us the seeds of our destiny. He's telling us what life is all about. Life is all about Christ. Abiding with him. Being shaped and formed and fashioned into his likeness. Abide in me. The fruitful and faithful Christian life is vine-like. In its appearance, it's Christ-like. In its expression, the shape of our lives is christ form, resembling Christ, made to reflect his image. It is a seed in the ground. Christ deposits a renewed will in us. Verse 7, if you abide in me and your words and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now we hear that and we think, well, that sounds pretty good. But Jesus is not suggesting to us an invitation for personal wish fulfillment whereby God serves as a genie simply to grant us all of our wishes. No, what Christ is talking about is a renewed will planted in us as seeds so that our desires can change in accord with the will of God, whereby when that seed comes into fruition, we say, God, I want what you want. 
I desire what you desire. I want to ask things in keeping with what your will is. It is given to us as a seed. Sacrificial and perfecting love. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus is giving to us love. Depositing it in our hearts. We say to the Lord, perhaps you've talked to Jesus as I have. And I read the text. I read his teaching and he says, love your enemies. And I say to Jesus, Lord, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. I barely want to love my neighbor, let alone my enemy. And Perhaps Jesus responds to you like he does to me. And he says, I know you can't love your enemy. You can't do that by yourself. You're not capable of loving your enemy, let alone loving your neighbor. And so I am going to deposit my love in you as a seed, sacrificial and perfecting love that will allow you to excel in who you are called to be. Commandments. Christ puts his commandments in us as seed. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. God's desires to write his law upon our hearts. In the Old Testament people of God, God gave a seed. There were two tablets, the law written in stone. And they were to be deposited into the covenant community in order to produce righteousness. But here in the new covenant people of God, God inscribes those commandments upon our hearts. He puts them in our lives like seed. God is already at work. The word of God, the form of godliness, the will of God, the love of God, the commandments of God, and then finally and sixthly, the joy of God, deposited in our lives like seed. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. God deposits within us the possibility for deep satisfaction, joy, as we see God's purposes being worked out in our lives. Tremendous blessing, grace, goodness, given to us in order that we might become who God has called us to be, in order that we might walk in the abundant life, in order that we might be fruitful. All of these seeds God deposits into our lives. And we wish, don't we, if we're honest, Lord, thank you for giving me these seeds. Now cause them just to grow. But they won't. They won't grow unless certain conditions are met. They remain dormant. Why? Because God said in Genesis 2 that there was no man to work the ground. We must add to the seeds tillage. Certain things have to be uprooted. Certain things have to be turned over. Adam had to be brought onto the scene. He had to be placed on the face of the earth in order that he might take the ground and turn it up and over in order that the seed might receive the rain and there might be a harvest of righteousness. But there was no man to work the ground. And things have gotten worse. The ground has gotten hard. The soil has gotten compacted. There is this buildup and this packing up, this compact soil in our hearts. And the world has become hardened because of sin. And the land is not fruitful because there was no man to work the ground until that day that God sent his son, his one and only son, to serve the world as that new Adam who would come to work the ground. He came to till the hearts of our lives, to turn things up and over, and he does that as he takes the human condition upon himself. As I was studying this text this week, and I was reminded of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I was taken to Psalm 129.3, and I almost put my hands in my head as I read the text. The plowers plowed upon my back. 
They made their long furrows. Jesus came. Not first to till up our hearts, but to receive the tilling in his own life. He breaks up the ground through his scourging, through his body that is broken. He breaks up the ground as the nails pierce his hands and his feet. He breaks up the ground as the spirit is thrust into his side. He breaks up the ground as the ground is opened up and a seed is put into the earth. And he breaks up the ground as he blows open the door of the tomb. And he comes out as the first fruit of the resurrection and our hope in life and death. Jesus breaks up the ground. He is the new Adam who tills the soil. That's exactly what Christ does. And the abundant life, if we are to walk in the abundant life, if we are to experience fruitfulness... We must go where Christ went. We must, by faith, say to the Lord Jesus Christ, your life is mine. I receive the tillage. I receive the brokenness. I receive you into my heart to break up the compact soil that has been baked by the sun in order that the seeds might be revealed. The abundant life is one in which we are invited to enter into tillage. And this means confession. And this means repentance. Jesus Christ comes to disrupt the well-curated and manicured grounds of our lives that we've created for ourselves. And they look so nice from the street, don't they? But they will not produce fruit. Christ comes to reveal the seeds that he has deposited into our lives so that the water, not only the tillage, but then also the water, so that the water might water and rain and activate those seeds. The waters of baptism, the waters of the Spirit, The waters of obedience, deluging the seeds. Baptism is not regeneration. Baptism will not create growth. But baptism is identification. It is the ingrafting into the covenant community. It is the ingrafting into the vine. Our whole identity changes and we are positioned to bear fruit. Now remember what Jesus said. Not every branch that is in the vine will produce fruit. And if it doesn't, it will be broken off. But you have absolutely 100% chance of producing no fruit whatsoever if you are not grafted into the vine. And So Jesus waters us. And he puts us into the vine whereby then we might enjoy and receive the waters of the Holy Spirit that renew our hard, hardened hearts. By faith, through grace, when we say, Lord, my heart is packed, it is dense, it is hardened, no water can penetrate unless you come to me by grace. As I confess my sin, turn over the soil of my heart and make me new. Thereby we might receive the waters and walk in the waters of obedience. We're called to a life of obedience, followed by that Holy Spirit. The waters of baptism that lead to the waters of the Spirit that lead to the waters of obedience. If you still have your Bibles open, turn to Joel chapter 2. I want to direct your attention to something that God does by way of water. Jesus is talking about three rains. The early rain, the abundant rain, and the latter rain. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain, baptism. Rain for your vindication. And he has poured down for you abundant rain. The rain of the Holy Spirit. The early and then the latter rain. The rain of obedience as before. Why has he done this? So that the threshing floors shall be full of grain. 
and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. God responds. He responds to the tillage. He responds to the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and he responds to your obedience in order that you might flourish and be fruitful. God has called us to a resurrection life, a fruitful life. He has deposited seeds in our lives, and then he turns over the soil, and then he adds the water in order that we might produce fruit. So as we prepare to go out into the world to live for him, I want you to remember three things. Take away three things from John chapter 15. First is this. The fruitful life is the gospel life. I'm not trying to suggest to you a new law. I'm not trying to give you a list of things to do in order that you in your own strength might produce some kind of fruit. I'm reminding you of the tremendous work of God on your behalf. First, Christ supplies the seed. He's put it into your life. Second, Christ supplies the labor and the cost of the tilling. And he took the furrows in his back in order that you might be fruitful. And third, he supplies the water. And he does that all for you and to you and through you by grace. Christ creates the conditions for our fruitfulness. Our job is to grow. To allow the word of God, the spirit of God, and the life of God to take full effect in our lives. What does that look like? It looks like this. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for depositing rich seed in my life. Thank you for adding to it that tillage that is required in order that those seeds might be exposed. Thank you for adding the waters of grace through the power of the Holy Spirit in your church and in my life in order that I might be fruitful. Our job is to grow in obedience and in keeping with our redeemed nature who God has made us. Our job is to respond by being fruitful in the vine. The fruitful life is a gospel life. Second, the fruitful life is a messy life. Growth is messy. It's not a linear process. Sometimes the the growth is happening under the ground and we're wondering, is anything ever going to happen? It's messy because it tempts our patience and encourages us to wait. It's messy Because sometimes we got to get down on our hands and our knees and put our fingernails into the soil and to see things nurtured. It's messy because it requires maintenance. Faithfulness is not a set it and forget it proposition. We must go out into the garden daily and to do the work that is necessary in keeping with righteousness. If we do not tend to our garden, there are a thousand intruders that will come and overtake it. It's messy. It's messy because it's humbling. God said, I am the vine. You are the branches. I want you to produce grapes. Lord, I want to make apples. I want you to produce grapes. Lord, I really enjoy rhubarb. I want you to produce grapes. It's messy because it's humbling. God says, I know what's in your best interest. I have a life that is, that is good and glorious. Produce fruit in keeping with my purposes for you. And then finally, fruitfulness is always for the purpose of celebration. Why does God want us to produce fruit in abundance? Because he wants us to enter into the joy, the full and abundant life of him. I look out here in the sanctuary and I see garden after garden after garden. I look and see a hundred people with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of seed that have been deposited in you. And God is working the soil of your life and he's putting rain into your life. He is watering you in order that you might produce fruit in abundance so that you can bring it here. 
And that we might enter into the presence of the master gardener, of the vine, of the king of kings and lord of lords, and present it back to him and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this abundance. Thank you for all this food. And Jesus says, go and eat. Celebrate. Live into the fullness of the abundance that I have given to you. It is why I have come. This is the abundant life. Grow. Grow. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have given us seed by grace, not any work that we might boast, but you have sovereignly and graciously deposited them into our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have worked the ground. You don't work us over. You were worked over. You were crucified. You were buried. You rose. You invite us to follow in your train to follow in the furrows that have, been, that have been dug out in order that there might be fruitfulness. You invite us to be well watered by your church, by the Spirit of God, watered through obedience in order that we might produce a harvest of righteousness in keeping with your purposes and plans for our lives. Lord, you want us to be men and women and children of abundance, not scarcity, but abundance. And so produce in us and through us for your glory and for the sake of a starving world that is hungry, that is forlorn, that has forgotten what it means to celebrate, has forgotten what it means to feast. Help us to be that people of abundance, of fruitfulness, so that the world might know and so that you might be glorified, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand with me and to join with me in our unison confession of faith, taken from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 16, article 2, on good works. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it that we believe? These good works, done in obedience to God's commandments, are the fruit and evidence of a true and living faith. By them, believers show their faithfulness, strengthen their assurance of salvation, edify their brothers in the Lord, and become ornaments of all those who profess the gospel. Good works in believers silence the criticism of the enemies of the gospel. They also glorify God by showing that believers are the workmanship and creation of Jesus Christ, because their aim is that holiness of living which leads to eternal life. Our closing hymn this morning, number 384, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing.
So now go out into the world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all men and women. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you. Today, tomorrow, until Jesus comes again. And then indeed it shall be forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. There is nothing greater than the people of God joining together for worship on the Lord's Day. We're so very glad that you have been with us this morning on our live stream. We started our live stream ministry a number of years ago to serve those who could not be with us in residential worship. Here at Beverly Heights Church, we place a high value on worship. We believe that God has called us to gather by his love for us each and every Lord's Day. If you are close to us here in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to personally welcome you and invite you to come and join with us in residential worship if you find yourself able. For those of you who may be joining us this morning who are not in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to encourage you to consider finding a local church where you can worship on the Lord's Day. You could even consider going to the EPC's website where they have a church locator to help you find a local church home. God bless.